I'm your host, Darren Heath. I can take a moment and thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to episode number 41 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. You can find the show notes by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash zero four one. Now, this episode, I am coming back to you after having a very interesting week, but we'll get to that in just a little bit. First, we have the gun of the show, and this time I figure I'm going to throw out there one of the more popular guns in my collection, and this is a gun that I carry more often than not. This particular handgun is the Sig Sauer P938. Now, I wanted one of these since they were first announced, and this particular model is not listed on Sig Sauer's website. It's uh, one of their little specialty packages. Maybe it's something that they only ship to certain distributors and a distributor exclusive or something like that. However, they don't list it on their website. Now, in all reality, the gun is a hybrid between the P938 AG and the P938 Black Rubber Grip model. Now, the AG features a dual-tone finish like mine, with the controls matching the color of the frame. The black rubber grip is completely blacked out, but it has the same grips, black rubber grips, as mine. So, basically, if you want to see what mine gun looks like, imagine the grips from the black rubber grip model on the uh, 930 AG dual-tone gun. Now, most of the other dual-tone guns will feature the controls the same color as the slide. Now, my particular gun came with a magazine of each size, as well as the Sig Sauer laser grip. And my understanding is not all the 938s come with both sizes of magazine. That's kind of an added feature for the package that I got. I don't know how true that is, but that's what I'm going to go with. And for the record, as far as this gun goes, I am listing an MSRP for the one without the laser. Now, the P938 is a 9mm version of the Sig P238 which is itself a licensed and slightly improved copy of Colt's Mustang 380 pistol that was based on the 1911 pattern. However, I am going to say that this gun is possibly one of the best guns that Sig Sauer could have ever released, at least for the concealed carry market. Now, due to the very similar size of the P238 and the 938, many accessories such as holsters, laser aiming devices, are likely to fit both the P238 and the 938. In fact, the holster I had made for my P238 actually works for my 938 every bit as well. And I had that made by a local gentleman that uh, I would give out his information, but he doesn't do holsters for anybody that he doesn't know. And only, only then will he do it if he approaches you. You cannot approach him and get one made. Okay, well, like I said, you know, many, many accessories will fit both guns, such as, well, the laser grip. Or it's not a grip, it's a trigger guard laser. Now, the trigger guard laser will fit both guns equally well. I believe uh, Crimson Trace's laser guard does the same thing. And overall, I have to say that, you know, the 938 is a pretty nice gun. Now, unlike many 238s, the 938 actually does feature an ambidextrous safety lever, making it ideal as a weak side carry backup gun or as a strong side carry primary gun. And because it is chambered in 9mm, it is considered by many to meet a minimum, as they would put it, performance level. In my personal opinion, minimum performance is a myth. If you're going to have a minimum performance level, you're not going to carry a gun. You want to carry a tank. Because even with a rifle, you cannot guarantee you're going to stop somebody. You can never tell when somebody's going to have, uh, when they have something like a strike plate underneath their clothing or something like that. So basically, if you're going to have a minimum performance level, you're not going to carry a gun. You're going to carry a tank. So let's get the specs on the 938 out there. You know, basically, it's a model P938. It's chambered in the 9mm, which is also known as the 9x19, 9mm Luger, 9mm NATO, and all the other names such as 9mm Auto. It's got a capacity of 6 plus 1 if you have the flush fit magazine in it and a capacity of 7 plus 1 if you have the extended magazine. And to be perfectly honest, I like to carry it with the flush fit and I like to carry the uh, full uh, extended magazine as a backup mag. <sighs> Excuse me, I had to back off and yawn and I've been fighting that for a while, so please forgive me. Now the action on this is a single action only gun and in all honesty... The trigger is a little heavy for a single action gun, but, and you know, it's a pocket gun too, so it, you kind of need that little heavier trigger just in case you somehow bump the safety off while carrying it. And with an ambidextrous safety, that is always a concern. 
Now the sights on this thing are Sig Light Night sights. The material is a the materials well. It's got a stainless steel slide. It's got an alloy frame and rubber grips. The weight of the gun is 16 ounces, and the MSRP for the base models that do not include the laser in the package is $836. Now that we've got all that out of the way, you know what? I want to run the audio, uh, that little audio clip to, that tells you how to get the show. And please, I need to get around to fixing this, but keep in mind that you can get the show on YouTube as well. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, and in the Microsoft Windows podcast store. Of course, you can always download the show and see the show notes as well as comment by going to the website, gunrightsintexas.com. Alrighty then, now that you know how to get the show, obviously you found it at some point since you're listening to it. I'm going to say that we do, I do have a little bit of personal news here. And if you do not believe in God, well, I do not intend to offend you, but let me just say that I do believe in God and I personally feel I am very much blessed because this weekend between recording episode 40 and releasing it, I was driving on an icy road and I'll be honest. I was probably driving a little too fast for the conditions, as testified by the evidence of what happened, and I had an accident. I laid my Jeep Wrangler over on its side, and I'll be honest, uh, it was not the most pleasant of experiences. Now, the reason I say I'm very much blessed is because once uh, things quit moving, I got uh, I got myself situated, took inventory. the The window that hit the dirt, which was the left window, was not broken. If it had been, I could have had some very serious lacerations out of that. And, even more importantly, I was relatively uninjured. My only injury from the wreck is a minor abrasion smaller than a dime. Now, if you have an accident that results in a rollover on an icy road, and your only injury is a minor abrasion smaller than a dime, you are a truly blessed individual. Now, my, I was the blessings did not stop there. I was continued, uh, the blessing I received continued because once we got the Jeep uprighted, the mirror on the side that hit the ground wasn't even cracked. It just folded up nice and neat along the side of the door, and after it was unfolded, it was usable again. Now, I'll be honest, things could have been much better, but they could have been far, far, far worse. I've talked to the insurance company. The vehicle is going in for repairs. It's going to be a little while. Mostly because there is a backlog of uh, places, or every place in town that has the quality of work that I want done, there is a backlog of uh, work for them. And basically, I'm looking at two to three weeks before it can get into the shop. At that point, the Jeep is going to have to be, it's going to have to go in, it's going to have to have some body work done on the left side, it's going to have to get some paint on the left side. And, you know, there's going to be a few repairs to the soft top. And after that, it'll be in, it'll be back in service. Don't get me wrong. I could have been killed, easily killed. But I'm fortunate. I am very much blessed. And let me just say that I have spoken enough about myself and what's recently happened. And the reason I bring it up is that has, that has taken up much of the free time that I would normally use to develop an episode. You know, dealing with the insurance company, dealing with the body shop, dealing with the shop that handles all the suspension repairs, all little bit of that. You know, the amazing thing is, even though it was rolled onto its side and then it was righted uh, about as roughly as it could be by the tow truck operator, the suspension damage is limited to two tires and a front end alignment. Now, a lot of people will be thinking, well, you know, you need to have those shocks checked. You need to have the springs checked. You need to get all this done. It has been. The shop is utterly amazed at how well that tough little Jeep came out of it. So let me just say that, you know, I feel pretty blessed about it. And even though I've been dealing with that, I do have an episode for you. In fact, I think I've rambled enough about my wreck that let's go ahead and run the little audio clip for the social media. And, you know, I want to see about adding a new social media group to that. I want to say, uh, I don't know which one it is. I want to add one to it pretty soon, and it'll probably be with the release of this episode. So look for it in the, look for that in the show notes as well. With that said, let me just run the audio clip that tells you how to find the show on social media. 
The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on social media. Links to all the social media profiles can be found on the website. On Twitter, the podcast is at Gun Rights NTX. On Facebook and Google Plus, it is Gun Rights in Texas. So please be social. All right, time for our primary topic here. And the primary topic on this episode, it's about some bad behavior by folks in the open carry movement. Now, the open carry movement in the past has demonstrated that they have a need to attack anyone who is not 100% on board with them. We can see this going back through the previous legislative sessions. I'm going to say the last three, and it may go back further than that, but the, the last three are the ones that, I, that I've actually seen it uh, manifest itself the most viciously. And we're going to go back through those last three, and we're going to look at some of the attacks that have been launched by those who have agreed to help them, those they felt should have been helping them or helping them more than they have, and those they have viewed as competing against them. Let's just put it that way. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. You know, in 2009, Debbie Riddle was asked to approach the Legislative Council here in Texas and get them to draft an open carry bill for the 2009 session. Well, Debbie Riddle did so, and then once the bill was drafted, she had lived up to the obligations that she had been asked to do, and she was then attacked by the open carry supporters for not filing the bill. Now, she had never agreed to file it. She had agreed to have it drafted, but she had never agreed to file it. And as a result, she was attacked. Now, one of the favorite groups of targets for the open carry advocates to attack are Charles Cotton, Alice Tripp, the TSRA, and the NRA. In each legislative session that open carry has been an issue, they have been attacked almost without mercy. Now, I'll be honest, these folks, have, they're gun rights advocates, okay? They go out there and they work hard to get anything passed that's pro-gun. Now, they do understand the legislative process a lot better than those that have not been involved in it or those who are just new to it. And they also they also have you know an understanding that, yeah, we don't have all the abilities that we want. We can only do so much. And in that category of only being able to do so much, they acknowledge that, well, you know, we, we only can get X, Y, Z done. We can get one. Sometimes we can get two. And very rarely we can get three flagship bills through and we can get a number of smaller ones through as well. Well, when you have a big issue like open carry, campus carry, parking lot protection, and things like that, you have, you have flagship issues. These are things that the media is going to jump on before the legislative session starts. And, you know, you, you have to limit how many flagship bills you have because each flagship bill eats up a ton of political capital. Well... Uh, Charles Cotton, Alice Tripp, the TSRA, the NRA, they were all seen as uh, having should have been trying to pass open carry. Now, like I said, you know, they had other legislation they needed to work on, and they had limited political capital, so they really couldn't work on anything they hadn't planned on outside of those set, outside of their flagship bills and the smaller minor bills. Now, you know, everybody, everybody says, you know, the TSRA is against open carry, the NRA is against open carry, let me let you in on a little secret. The NRA and the TSRA, and that includes uh, Alice Tripp, they have testified in favor of open carry even when it was not one of their issues that they were trying to push in that session. That's right. They weren't testifying against it. They weren't sabotaging it. They were testifying for it. Now, I'll be honest. If the bill could have passed, and even though they did nothing for it, they would have been happy with it. They wouldn't have tried to kill it. Unless the bill was somehow going to damage their efforts. You know, let's say you have a, uh, let's say somebody brings up an open carry bill. And while it does have open carry, it has gun registration and confiscation added into it. You can almost guarantee the NRA and the TSRA will kill that. Because do we want to gain at the cost of losing everything? No, we don't. Do we want to gain at the cost of losing critical ground? No, we do not. In fact, we don't want to gain at the cost of anything that we already have, whether we've always had it or if it's something that uh, we've just recently won back. We do not want to cost ourselves any progress that we have already made. Once we lose it, we may never get it back. I mean, it's taken over 130 years to get open carry back into the legislature with a good chance of it being passed in some form. Think about that. Think about the fact that 
It's been over 130 years since you could legally open carry a firearm. And it's not from a lack of people trying to get it done. I mean, there's been a long time it hasn't been tried. But there's been other issues in gun control that we've been trying to undo. Other issues we've been trying to, you know, make other pro- make gains in other areas on. And, you know, Charles Cotton, Alice Tripp, the organizations that they represent, uh, Tara Micah as well, you know, these folks, they are, they are advocates for us. And they are fighting for us. They, ha- they have long-term plans and they have short-term plans. But in the long run, I guarantee you, if they could wave a magic wand and make all the gun laws disappear and make it where only the actions involving a weapon were the crime, you can bet they would do it. Let me tell you how I know this. It's not because I communicate with them very often because I've never spoken with Tara Micah that I know of. I've had two conversations with Alice Tripp. I've had you know, a number of conversations via internet with uh, Charles Cotton, uh, two or three conversations on the phone and the conversations on the phone you can find on this podcast and on the uh, pro gun podcast. It's because these people are working for us and they want to get rid of these gun laws. They understand the process though, and they know they can't do it all at once. Now, another favorite target that the uh, open carry movement has targeted in the past is the campus carry advocates. Now, in 2009, it was at its peak, and as late as 2011, they were still seen as competition by the open carry advocates. Now, the attacks on campus carry were, they, they may have prevented campus carry from passing, and if, that was, if campus carry had passed, you could have seen that political capital diverted to something else. And you know what that would have probably have been? Open carry. But no, Shane McCrary from the Lone Star Citizens Defense League, the folks in the OpenCarry.org bunch, they attacked anything they saw as potential competition to their bill. And at one point, they, they, thought, oh, they thought campus carry had a very good chance of passing. And what they did was they wanted to get open carry rolled into the campus carry bill. It really wasn't germane. It would not have flown through the legislature in all odds, but they were going to try and get it inserted anyway. Well, the campus carry advocates realized that if open carry was rolled into their bill, it probably wouldn't let either of them pass. As a result, the campus carry advocates resisted having it rolled into their bill, so it wasn't rolled into their bill. And then the open carry advocates attacked the the campus carry bill, and they did everything they could to scuttle it, and they succeeded. You know, they, the people that want uh, schools to remain victim-rich environments, they all succeeded in destroying the chances of campus carry passing in three different sessions, probably two involving open carry, because 2013 wasn't quite as vicious. 2013, it was more of an attack on other efforts. But then you also have the problem with open carry advocates using half-truths, innuendos, and flat-out lies to further their efforts. And these are almost always part of their attacks on people. Although in some cases, they have been used to make their case or in some instances to attack legislation that was being pushed by what they view as competition. And it's not even competition from the gun banners. It's competition from their own side as they viewed it. And we'll start with something a little more recent. Open Carry Texas and others claim that the NRA makes money off of licensing and that it will do nothing to endanger that uh, income. Now, I'm going to say that this is actually a half-truth. The NRA does generate a little income from certifying instructors. However, it's a very tiny percentage of their budget. And when you think about it, you know, this is really what the NRA is set up to do. The NRA is a training organization first and foremost. That's what it was founded to be. Now, the NRA and the TSRA, they supported two bills in 2013 that eliminated or reduced the need for a CHL class or instructor for CHL renewals. That's right. They supported two bills that reduced the training requirement. Now, one bill eliminated the need to have a renewal class altogether. And the second bill, which is kind of a backup plan, allowed for an online renewal class. How about that? Not only did they take in, uh, reduce the amount of training required, they did it without being forced to. Hmm, that's kind of cool. Oh, wait a minute. That couldn't have happened because Open Carry Texas claims they make money off of it and they won't do anything to endanger them making that money. Sorry about bumping the microphone there, but I had to to move away and avoid laughing too hard. And that's pure sarcasm. I was just repositioning the microphone. Okay, 
Let's move on to some of the past attacks. And we'll, we'll start with Shane McCrary once again. He was the president of what is now the defunct Lone Star Citizens Defense League. And they attacked legislation such as the parking lot bill that other pro-gun organizations pushed because it wasn't open carry. And in the show notes, I'll throw a link out there where you can find uh, find the actual uh, description that he put in. But basically, he was claiming that the uh, range protection bill was, how do you best go about this? But he claimed it was destroying uh, certain protections that the TSRA had fought for in previous sessions. Those protections were, I don't know, things like banning confiscation in emergencies and stuff like that. Or, let's see, what else was it? You know, I don't have the internet on this computer at the moment. I, I'm in the process of rearranging the studio slightly. So I can't look up the thread that I'm going to link to. But let me just say that the he was claiming it was going to attack, I think it was the preemption law. And it was going to hurt the, uh, let's see, it's going to hurt preemption and the protections for uh, conf- against confiscation in emergencies. I think that was it. But it seems like there was a third thing he was claiming it was going to destroy. And basically, it was because the bill was a well-written bill that didn't touch things it didn't have to. And he felt that, well, he could use that to you know, sow a little bit of uncertainty and cause an attack on the TSRA and the NRA's uh, reputation. Well, history has proven him wrong. It's all there. It's still safe. But then he and the Lone Star Citizens Defense League also attacked the parking lot bill because they felt it was an infringement on property owners' rights. While at the same time, they were demanding that 30-06 apply to open carry as well because they felt property owners would ban open carry if they saw it. That was a little bit two-faced on their part, but, you know, whatever works for them worked for them. Oh, wait a minute, it didn't work at all. But like I said, you know, the Lone Star Citizens Defense League, the, you know, they they no longer are around, and that's because of their bad behavior. We have not seen this level of bad behavior from Open Carry Texas yet. I have a sneaking suspicion we're going to see this level of bad behavior uh, from them if they don't get their way. You want an example of how bad it can get? Look at Open Carry Tarrant County. These guys are, it's almost like they're saying, okay, how can we hurt the chances of getting Open Carry passed today? And I'm going to come out and say it. I'm going to, I'm going to predict that Open Carry Texas, come and take it, Gun Rights Across America, and the National Association for Gun Rights will claim that the TSRA and or the NRA killed House Bill 195 when it fails. And there are major problems with HB 195. However, it can still be fixed, and it can still become the best possible result we can hope for. However, due to the bad actions of the people that support it, you can pretty much write off House Bill 195 as it sits right now. You have... uh, You have a lot of in-your-face tactics being thrown about by the supporters of it. And unless something changes and changes soon, the bill's going to be dead. And I suspect that uh, you can prove this by looking at the fact that uh, C.J. Grisham has uh, started to tone things down for Open Carry, Texas. He's asked Open Carry Tarrant County to tone it down a little. He's asked Katie to tone it down a little. And I'll be honest, this does not sound like the typical uh, things you can expect from C.J. Grisham. We've had him on the show twice, here and once on the uh, Pro Gun Podcast. And I'll be honest, CJ is not the most uh, gentle of people when it comes to words. So why is he asking that things be toned down? I suspect it's because Stickland has asked CJ to tone things down to help get HB 195 passed. And if you don't believe me, look at what he has said to Open Carry Tarrant County or Corey Watkins about it. And look at what he said about Katie and their building a gun at the Capitol. You know, he's asked them, hey, just back off on this. Don't do this. You're hurting. You're doing more damage than good. And this is out of character for CJ. And we're going to leave it at that. So let's move on and talk about what we can do to actually get stuff passed. First and foremost, we need to read up on the bills and we need to act on the calls to action when they are issued. You now, these call to action or these calls to action. Let me get my tongue untied. These calls to action will be issued by the TSRA, the NRA, and of course, Charles Cotton with his Texas Firearms Coalition. We can communicate with our elected officials, and we can discuss their position. That's also important. And I'm going to let you in on another secret. You can listen to the uh, next special release episode, which will be the first special release episode. And for that one, I'm working to get Charles Cotton on so he can tell us how to be more statesmanlike in our efforts to convince our officials that our positions matter. Now, you may be thinking, well, why do we want to do this? This, we want to do this because it doesn't matter if it's open carry, campus carry, 
or uh, reducing the off-limits locations for CHL holders, or maybe we're trying to remove some goofy little restriction here or there. It doesn't matter. What matters is that we want to get it passed. We want, in the end, we want the we don't want the uh, tools to be the basis of the law. We want the actions to be the basis of the law. And what I'm saying is, a gun shouldn't be any more illegal than a pocket knife, which should be no more illegal than a buoy knife, and a buoy knife should be no more illegal than a pebble found on the sidewalk. However, our law is written so that uh, so that it attacks uh, you know tools. And really, that's wrong. We got to do something about the law so that it does not attack the tools, but it attacks the actions of those that wield the tools. If I could take and wave a magic wand, we'd have no gun control laws, we'd have no knife laws. However, we would suddenly see an increase in the use of a weapon law. If you use a weapon to commit a crime, well, that just escalates the uh, severity of the crime and it escalates the uh, penalty. And that's what I would do. Well, Getting back to the uh, subject of getting Charles on, we're going to get Charles Cotton, and we're going to try to, and I've been talking to him, we would have probably tried to do something this week, but he's been at an NRA meeting, and I wish him all the luck there. And I would like to say that uh, with the with the uh, podcast, one thing I want to do is I want to create a resource for anybody that's working for gun rights in Texas to be able to communicate or to learn. And the very first special release episode's hopefully going to be out in the next week or two. And hopefully the subject will be uh, Charles Cotton telling us how we can be better advocates. And we're going to be very statesmanlike in our advocacy. We're not going to be political. We're going to be statesmanlike. Because everybody knows, back in the day when we had statesmen and not politicians, we were better off. And with that said, I want to run the contact promo or audio clip, whatever you want to call it. And then we'll get on to the news. If you want to contact the podcast... Please send email to Aaron at gunrightsintexas.com or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is gunrightsintexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409 292 6736. And we are back for the new segment, which We're going to have a little bit of criminal activity in the news. We're going to have a little bit of in defense of self and others. And then we're going to touch on a little bit of politics, and that'll wrap up the show, at least until we get to the Texas legislative update, which is going to be very brief. Well, let's hit it off. In the criminal activity category, we got two stories. The first story is where the FBI is investigating a shooting at a veterans clinic in El Paso. Now, the suspect and one victim are deceased. Now, when you consider the fact that the shooting occurred at a VA clinic, which is federal property, and federal property has a complete ban on firearms, it only serves us as as a reminder, good Lord, serves us, serves us, serves us, serves us as a reminder. However, it serves us as a reminder that gun control actually costs lives. It does not save lives. And in our next criminal activity report, this one is out of state, but I feel, oh man, I feel it's kind of important. To mention it because this is going to be a little bit of a high profile case and the reason it's going to be a high profile case it involves the new york jets running back chris johnson now chris johnson was arrested in his hometown of orlando florida for illegal carrying a handgun illegally open carrying a handgun let me put it that way now the weapon was under the seat of his vehicle and not locked in a container as is reportedly required by florida law i don't know about you but this is a stupid law open carry would have pretty much solved that for him I find it interesting, though, that the news article is actually reporting it as he's arrested for openly carrying. And in all honesty, he's not openly carrying. He's um, he's actually carrying a concealed weapon, but he's carrying in a manner that's not allowed by law. And that's what he got busted for. I'm just glad he was arrested in uh, Florida, not in New York, where he works. And the reason for that is if he had been busted in New York for it, well, it would have been ugly. At least in Florida, it's a uh, level, it's a second level misdemeanor, which in Texas would be a Class B misdemeanor. And then we have in defense of self and others. This story is an officer involved shooting in Freeport, Texas, and we and in this one we have a very interesting situation. In this story, uh, community activist Quanal X and the deceased uh, party's girlfriend are stating their support for the actions of law enforcement in this incident. 
Now, what's being reported is that police were called to the scene of a domestic disturbance where the deceased had kicked in the door and was found assaulting his girlfriend. When he was approached by police, he pointed a handgun at his girlfriend's head and was, uh, and was almost immediately shot by police in an effort to save her life. Now, a lot of people were wanting to throw a protest together, you know, the whole hands up, uh, don't shoot things and all that. However, if they had, you know, if the police had not shot this guy, he probably would have killed the girlfriend. And then the police would be having to deal with a protest of, well, you were there, you had guns, why didn't you stop him? You know, it was a no, it was a no win situation until Quantal X stepped in and said, hey, they did exactly what they were supposed to do. They saved her life. And on this one, I am going to, I'm going to say that while I normally don't find myself agreeing with anything Quantal X says or does, I'm going to say, uh, add a boy to him. He deserves an add a boy on that one. And we're going to stick to uh, stories that are making the news because of people's skin color because, well, that seems to be the rage these days in the news. And I find this to be an interesting thing because anytime you see the Huey P. Newton gun club in the news, well, you can almost bet it's because of their ties to the new Black Panther Party. Now, they're making news for their open carry and other activities. And I'll be honest. The Huey P. Newton Gun Club does have strong ties to the new Black Panther Party. Do not dismiss that. In the article, you know, they're talking about how they're doing military-style training. They're, uh, you know, they're actually jogging, and apparently there's a couple of former Army Rangers that are uh, helping train them. And they're doing this around the Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, Park. I believe this is in the Houston area, maybe the Fifth Ward area. I'm not familiar with that part of the state. However, they're in the news, and basically they're trying to, I think what the media is trying to do is they're trying to say, well, you got to do something about these people carrying guns. And if you're going to, if you want to ignore the white people carrying guns, maybe you want, maybe you want to ignore the black people carrying guns. I got news for them. I don't care what color their skin is. I don't care how they talk. I don't care what country they originally came from. As long as they're law-abiding citizens, they should be able to carry that gun. And I hope our legislators are that way. I hope our legislators are not as racially biased as our news media. Our news media sees uh, sees racism where there is none. You can have you can have the Rainbow Coalition in a room uh, talking about how how it's all a lovey dovey hippie world, and the news media show up and talk about racism in the room. And I'll be honest, there's no point to trying to make this a racial issue. It's just frustrating to see this in the news. It really is. There is nothing in the news that frustrates me more than this level of stupidity in the media. Well, it's black people with guns, so you got to do something now. No, we don't. We do not. Well, uh, 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 maybe if they had, uh, turbans on their heads. Mmm, probably not. If they were pointing the guns at people, that might be different. Once again, though, skin color would not matter. If they're pointing the guns at people, they deserve to get shot. I don't care if they're white and wearing pointy hats or if they're uh, African-American wearing ski mask and uh, saying racially divisive things as they march. I don't care if uh, they're jumping up on a table with a turban on their head saying things about uh, God is good or anything like that. I don't care if they're going to point a gun at somebody. They need to be shot. And the reason I say that is when you have somebody that's going to point a gun at somebody, they're a bad guy. And the way you stop a bad guy with a gun, you have a good guy with a gun. Preferably, you have multiple good guys with a gun. Anyways, that wraps up the news, and we're going to sign the show off, and then I'm going to give you a very brief legislative update. And it's going to be so brief that, well, if you skip it, you're not going to miss anything. Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please carry responsibly. And we are back. We are back for the very final segment of the show, which is the Texas Legislative Update. Now, this episode is being released on Sunday, January 11th of 2015. Now, for those who do not know, this is, uh, well, on Tuesday, 
That's right. Tuesday, January 13th of 2015, the Texas legislature goes into session. And basically, that's the uh, Texas legislative update for this episode. We are now getting ready to go and win gun rights victories in the legislature. And if you cannot do that, then maybe you're listening to the wrong show. If you cannot help do this, maybe you need to go join the Mayors Against Illegal Guns Coalition or the Moms Demand Action or whatever it is. But folks, get ready. Go out there and do what you can to help get legislation passed. Do what you can to help win this battle for open carry. Help win this battle for campus carry. Help win this battle for removing restrictions on concealed carry license holders. I don't care what part of it is important to you. Let's go out there and let's move the ball forward. With that said, I'm going to end the show and we're going to uh, we're going to call it a day or a week, at least until the next episode's released, whether it's a special edition or not. With that said, stay safe and please carry responsibly.